Well, it's time uh, for our next panel now, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Now, let me ask you a question. Why do you buy a car? In previous years gone by, uh, it used to be for the horsepower. I suspect for many people in the room, it might still be the horsepower um, or the engineering. But in future, what is inside a vehicle is going to be just as important as what is under the bonnet or the hood. The rise of in-vehicle experiences is bringing a new front to the rivalry between car makers. And we're going to dig into that now in this next session. We're going to be joined by Thomas Danneman, who's a senior director from Qualcomm. By Amanda Stratton, who's an automotive TV broadcaster. By James Tal, who is the director for new business models at Jaguar Land Rover. And by Barry Napier, the chief executive of Cubic Telecom. Please welcome them to the stage. You don't all have to squeeze together because we do have we do have one person joining remotely. I'll come to the next There we go. Well done. Thank you. Um, so I want to begin, and just a reminder, as always, do ask your questions over Slido and questions digitally, and we will try and come to those throughout the session. And um, uh, Thomas, I'd like to begin, please, if I can, with you. What is changing inside the cockpit in terms of technology, and which of those changes do you think is going to be the biggest or most significant? Thanks for being here. Uh, there will be certainly big changes in the future inside the car. So the overall uh, user experience that you see inside the car is changing massively. So in the past, we had almost no or very small displays. And now in the future cars, you will have displays going from left to the right. Uh, we have multiple displays, high resolution, even up to 4K resolution displays uh, being powered inside the car. That is massive compute that you need to drive these. So with our Snapdragon processors, we will be able to drive with a very uh, technology GPU heavy CPU systems. So this is how we enable the new user experience. And just as an add-on, uh, can you imagine that you don't have mirrors in your car anymore? So we will replace mirrors by electronic mirrors. So you will see inside the display in the car, what's going behind you. And that is certainly massively changing the user experience and also how the user in the future will use and handle with a car. Great. Thank you very much. Barry, I'd like to come to you on this question as well. What are the biggest changes you see in terms of uh, technology and how you play in that? Well, I see that connectivity is played uh, in the backbone of absolutely everything. So if you talk, if you listen to what Thomas is saying about uh, everything that Qualcomm is doing, we've worked with Qualcomm since 2011 and they've invested in Cubic. Uh, five times. We've now connected cars in 103 countries. It's all about the user experience and the only way to do that in real time is with connectivity. And everyone thinks connectivity is a simple component that you put in the SIM card and away you go. But then you've got laws, complexities, compliance behind that, regulatory issues. So I think the whole architecture has become extremely uh, complicated. But going forward, you heard Eve yesterday from Stellantis saying that they've 11 million vehicles and they want to go to 40. Uh, million connected vehicles. So the whole idea of connectivity and the user experience has to be done in real time and those insights need to be taken and processed. So I think if you get that connectivity right in the whole beginning, all the user experience, and then you can localize that experience to any market or any type of device. And that's where you're going to get real adoption of people really enjoying the new type of electrical vehicles and connected vehicles. Thank you. James, I want to come to you on this because new business models is uh, potentially a vast title in terms of the things that is going to define the, the car makers in the future. Um, when you're thinking about new in-vehicle experiences, what does that actually look and feel like for a, a driver? I, I think the most important change in technology for us is alongside the connectivity is the ability to update the car over the air. And so Whereas that might have been about fixing problems, moving forward it gives us the opportunity to have a direct interaction with our current customer base on an ongoing basis and actually provide updatable experiences. So that rather than talking about subscriptions economies or, or how just that we can drive revenue in that space, actually we can provide a product and a service that can be direct with our customer base and, and updated and improved that experience over time. How does your business model as an OEM actually need to change? Because at the moment, and historically, you guys are a hardware manufacturer. If you start becoming a service provider, other revenue streams, all these different things, does the business model of the OEM actually have to change? Yeah, both the way in which we engineer our cars and also the way in which we take it to market. So from an engineering perspective, we've now over 2,500 software engineers uh, directly in 
uh, across the world. Um, and that's important because that helps our both onboard software and our, and off, our offboard architecture to be able to provide that, that experience. And then from a go-to-market perspective, we have to create that relationship with the customer that traditionally we do through our retailers. And our retailers do a great job in, in wholesaling those vehicles to those customer base. But we have the ability to talk direct, to offer those products and those services direct, and then to drive a, an experience that actually does get better over time, but actually makes people want to come back to our great brands. Uh, Amanda, I want to bring you in here, because you obviously spend a lot of time talking to consumers, looking at the industry. What is it people actually want in their vehicles in the future? To my mind, it's actually usability. So having all the functions, all the connectivity, and all the other um, te technologies is wonderful. The really key factor is actually making it user-friendly for people, not just people who are in the automotive industry, but for people like my mum and, and your mum, and, and people who aren't car-minded. Um, at the end of last year, I was lucky enough to drive 16 brand new EVs back to back over the space of two days. And the thing that struck me about it was that they all had the same functionality, but the actual user experience in these cars was totally different. Um, some of them I could get into and they were intuitive. I knew exactly where to go. I, I would know which menus I needed to open, whereas others I found really difficult. Um, and so for me, I think consumers of the future are going to want their car and, and the user experience to be easy but also to be a little bit like their, their phone, where today you load your profile, your preferences, your home screen, everything that you want, but perhaps when you update your car, you, you, all of that is going to be preset for you. You don't have to go through that whole process from the beginning. What is it that separates the, the ones that work from the ones that don't? For me, it was the interface. It's the, it's the way you have to go into menus. It's, the fact that it wasn't necessarily logical as to where things were in a menu. Um, now, I was driving these cars back to back. I didn't have a huge amount of time with them, but my point is I know cars, so I knew what I was looking for and I was finding it difficult. I mean, there was one car which actually, it took me half an hour to find the radio. And I mean- It's kind of in the middle, isn't it? I well, <laughs> yeah. there were no buttons and it was actually really hard because everything was done on a central screen it was really hard to actually find where the radio was. Now, okay, I mean, that's an extreme example, but I think for, for the cars that are coming to market today, but also when we're looking to the future, particularly with more, um, more connectivity, more services being actually delivered to the consumer, we have to make it usable and user-friendly. Can I come in just on that? When you were talking there, you couldn't find the radio. This goes back to the OTA that you're talking about. I think where you're gonna see cars going is more on demand. So they're gonna take the real insights from the connectivity that's in the vehicle, the user experience, and really be able to customize on demand to either a subset of uh, individuals, uh, different cultures, whoever really wants a certain feature, they can really home in on that and do it over the air rapidly. And I think that's where you're gonna see the massive change in cars, where it's gonna be really customizable. So the software engineers that you see, those user experiences are gonna just keep getting enriched all the time. I want, to bring in, I want to bring in Thomas on this quickly. James, don't worry, we are going to come to you about the issue of screens and cars, but you know that. Um, I want to bring in Thomas on this, because obviously you provide technology for lots of different sectors. How are you thinking differently about automotive in terms of the technology needs compared to other industries that you look at? You're absolutely right. So in the automotive industry, we have seen a heavy shift towards digital, always on and autonomous cars. So for this reason, Qualcomm has developed what we call the digital chassis. So it's a basket of technologies that enables you to do what you just discussed for writing the applications. Our dis di digital chassis consists out of, first of all, the telematics, so the connectivity to the internet and to other devices around the car. Then we have a car to cloud service, which enables you to deliver additional services and new streaming services to the car. Uh, then we have the digital cockpit experience. So this is all about driving the displays and the user interface inside the car. That can be the displays, but it's also voice control and everything that helps you to interact with your car. And lastly, of course, the majority here in the future will be the autonomous driving. So while the car is taking more and more over the driving functionality, you will gain much, much more time back to do valuable tasks while taking a ride. So you're not driving anymore, so you're riding your car. 
And while you're driving your car, you can do many, many more uh, features. You can use the utilization of the car. And imagine you can run a video conference out of the car while you are traveling. So actually, I'm looking forward to seeing this technology. And maybe if I can briefly tell you a little story from, from my business life is, uh, when I started in Qualcomm, we had the first discussions with customers who wanted to bring together the central IVI system with a cluster display. Actually, at that time, the cluster was an analog cluster. So they were introducing displays to run the cluster. And so with this technology, we have been able to merge those two displays into a single SOC. And what we will see more and more is that the customers need solutions where they can build up and deliver or uh, develop their added value, which are the applications and the uh, features that the customer is identifying himself with the car. And this is exactly to what the colleagues uh, described earlier. So the user inside the car will experience the car in the future much different than we did it 20 years ago. Great, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, James, I want to come back to you on the issues of screens and consumer interface. Now, Amanda was sufficiently coy, not to mention which vehicles were good or bad, so I don't know how yours fared in that. Um, but how are you thinking about the issue of simplicity, interactivity, and fundamentally, from a safety point of view, every time you have to do anything, whether it's change the radio or air conditioning or anything else, you've got to use a screen. Is that really safe in the future? Well, I think, you know, the way that technology is moving, it will help us to, to use uh, alternatives for that. For, for example, you know, we, we have Alexa in car now today, for example, so we are working much more on voice-based um, activities as well as Alexa itself. I think the important thing for us is to have a, as we, and we have done the last few years, a much laser sharp focus on that customer user experience. So taking customer journey stories, user stories, and ensuring we've walked through those through as opposed to probably just engineering by each individual area of the car. So then when the, the full experience comes together, maybe on, on some vehicles, it doesn't come together as well as, as anyone would like. For us, that laser sharp focus on the full user experience helps to then drive that, whether it be um, uh, operating through a touch screen, through your device sometimes, uh, from the back seat, which we can do in our vehicles as well into the car. Um, or whether that be through voice assistant. And then moving forward, we are increasing our technology and our head-up display as well, for example. Getting the experience of the combination of all of those right is, is the most important focus that we have. And we've moved our engineering team from, from working in that kind of waterfall approach to more software-based agile, which then allows more rapid development. And maybe all automotive uh, manufacturers have suffered in the past, which is the time to market. If we can shorten that time to market, then our technology will be much more up to date with the likes of your devices, your phones and your tablets. So therefore, customers can have the experience that's all joined together that they, they really do need. Well, the, the time to market issue is a really interesting one because obviously hardware runs at a very long cycle in terms of development and in terms of life on the road. Um, software technology, chip technology as well, all moves on very quickly. So often, technology that's in the car is already out of date by the time it comes to the road. Um, Thomas, I'd like to come to you first on this, but we'll ask everybody, how do you deal with this issue that technology moves much faster than hardware refreshes? Yeah, absolutely right. That's an important thing, how we need to accelerate the time to market. Uh, this is why it is super important that uh, OEMs and ourselves are working with technology leaders right away. So let's assume Google. Uh, Google was introducing uh, Android to the automotive industry a few years back. But with introducing Android, uh, this life cycle of software and software updates is becoming more and more important. And maybe uh, 10 years ago, you remember, we had built an uh, infotainment system which were running Linux. We developed multiple years in getting the system together because we put all these different components, a GPS sensor, a microcontroller, a graphics unit together and try to get this up and running. In the Nowadays, we have to really look into uh, solution providers like Qualcomm who are providing a lot of technology in one basket that you can start using. So the latest Android version is running there already. You can really build on top the applications and the use experience that the car driver is expecting. So this is how Qualcomm can really enable the customers to deliver very state-of-the-art technology right away. And that inside multiple ecosystems. So we can do this with Android, we can do this with Banma, Tencent, so there are other ecosystems around the world which needs to be supported and where time to market is really critical to have always the latest software version running inside a vehicle. Great, thank you. Um, Barry, can I come to you next on this question about the difference between hardware speeds and software speeds? I think uh, 
Recently, you've seen uh, with the chip shortage over the last two to three years and the impact, and you heard Herbert yesterday saying that he thinks by the end of this year that'll uh, start correcting itself. I think that's where you see the massive shift to everyone moving to cloud and try to see as much as possible that they can do as much processing in the cloud, especially with the EV vehicles as well, with weight distribution and ECUs. So I think you're going to see an awful lot of dependency as we see that the short, uh, the short uh, staffing in software coders around the world, we're all struggling to get them to make sure that we're getting the right software and into the right stack. Thomas talked about Qualcomm's car to cloud solution, so you can see that the semiconductors are now moving to everything into the cloud and try to get as much functionality into the cloud. And that really goes into the lifecycle management then. So before when a vehicle came out, people weren't thinking of lifecycle life management based on connectivity, based on getting to the cloud. Now that those on-demand features are coming out and everything else, I think that customization is really going to focus auto, man auto manufacturers to the cloud solutions. Great, thank you. Amanda, can I come to you next? I mean, how do you think car makers are able to stop their tech and the cars feeling dated? I, th I mean, I guess it comes back down to uh, regular software updates over the air. That's the really important thing. But I think also, again, coming back to that user experience, um, it's, it's making sure that every single application is exactly what the consumer wants, but recognizing the fact that different consumers are gonna have different requirements as well. I think, but just picking up on one of the panels that I was doing yesterday, um, one of the things that struck me actually in that was, was you know, I think we're, we're all accustomed to the fact that our mobile phones, even in central London or, or, or driving down the M40, we can sometimes lose connectivity. And I think that's a concern with many people when they are reassured that all this technology is going to come to them over the air. The problem comes when you think, OK, well, I, I live in uh, you know, a, a modern Western civilization and I still have no mobile phone service. So how are we going to address and fill that hole when we have outages of, of the, the current cellular network um, or indeed natural disasters? Um, how is that going to affect? Because, of course, it's not just consumer vehicles. Obviously, you have to think about goods vehicles military vehicles and, and all the other types that are on the road as well. Thank you. Um, James, I want to come to you on, on this issue and another question that's come in. Oh, that was unexpected. I want to come in to you on a, a question that's come in to this, which feeds into this, which is about, aren't consumers going to prefer the same OS and apps in their car that they use outside it? How do you, when you're developing services for in the vehicle, make it, do you want to make it feel like an iOS experience? Or do you want to make it feel like a Jaguar Land Rover luxury experience? How do you balance those two things? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the simple answer is we have to offer both. Um, we have feedback from all of our customers that, that some will use um, you know, Apple CarPlay and, and Android Auto in China, Baidu Car Life, but others actually like the native system and the, the, the offer that that gives. You know, our most recent 21 model year vehicles were all updated with, uh, with the latest level of, of, of software and infotainment, a new infotainment system. Actually, you can really see the difference of that update and how, um, how the uh, native system can interact with the vehicle well to know the car, know what it's doing, know our customers. And actually over time, because of those over the air updates, using that native system will actually help provide the customers with a better customer experience because we can co correlate all of those sets of data. But clearly, those that want to bring their home ecosystem to the car, we, we will allow for that as well. And then work out the integration between the two of them so that it can be seamless, depending on the customer's choice. What sort of percentage at the moment of people who, who take your vehicles use CarPlay, Android Auto, what percentage rely almost entirely on the in-house system? It would just be interesting to see that, because particularly if it's the, if it's the iOS system, that raises a big question about how you differentiate. Yeah, it, it's hard to give a straight answer in percentage terms because quite a few customers sit in the middle and use both. So we see, it, I would say it's roughly 50-50, but actually there's a whole portion in the middle who will sometimes use their device, uh, but other times use the car. So for example, we have Spotify embedded in our vehicle um, that gives you know, a much better reception through the car to be used on the go. So customers, once they've used that, actually we see that they prefer that than bringing the system in because it provides that ecosystem in as part of the vehicle. So, so that's about the proportion. But how do, you, how do you, in a world where half your customers use those, how do you provide a premium luxury experience when I can use the same, exactly the same in-car entertainment system on...
same names, entry-level model that's much cheaper. Well, we, uh, the, the key thing is moving forward is we'll bring a lot of services to that vehicle as well. So I talked about embedded Spotify, I've talked about Amazon Alexa. So into that native system, we will then bring in with partners uh, further services that will enhance that experience of not just having the vehicle to drive, but the vehicle with those peripheral services. Part of our reimagined strategy is moving from being a purely product-led company to products and services that will open up uh, those ecosystems, particularly uh, working with um, our partners, some that we've mentioned. We've recently um, agreed a, a partnership with NVIDIA, as an example, that from 2025 we will work with them on a number of in-car technologies as well. So we'll continue with that approach. Thank you. We've had a question come in. Uh, will the car manufacturers always be behind the mobile phone companies when it comes to getting the latest chipsets? Uh, well, we should go to the chip expert on that. Thomas. Uh, that is certainly not true anymore, I would say. Uh, we see that the car OEMs are very sensitive to what they are building into their cars. The refresh cycles of technology has massively increased. So uh, 20 years ago, when I started in my business, we typically said five to six years for an hardware architectures. Now, actually, what we are seeing is uh, two or three years is what the car OEMs are looking for upgraded in, in processors. The other thing that, of course, also helps is if the OEMs are considering the headroom in compute and performance so that the systems can be upgraded. And this is also what we offer via our um, car to cloud services that you can upgrade uh, the processors, the software over the air, even giving more performance to the customers than originally planned inside the system. So there are techniques and, and methods to uh, bring more experience to the car. And maybe just to add on uh, on the topic about how can uh, the luxury OEMs ensure that the customers are experienced luxury. Well, we had recently a project with one of the OEM who are defining a in-car cinema system. So who are bringing in a very wide screen inside a car, uh, bringing a very nice audio system, high uh, resolution uh, videos. So that is really a, a unique experience that you even cannot do at your home because you have your own car, you are separated, you have two people or three people maximum sitting there and you can really enjoy your own private cinema. Great. Also, if you think about it, you, you're spending between three to 500 pounds on a phone and your life expectancy is two to three years of that device. When you're spending 50, 60,000. Tell me where car. you buy your phones. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you look at it, then if you're buying a vehicle, you, you, that goes back to the whole cloud statement where they need to keep enriching the, the devices uh, and, and the solutions that you said you're talking about, not just a product, it's all about the services that you're adding. And if you were talking, with the way you were talking earlier, it's all about the updates. So you'll be able to understand from the insights of what the customer is using. So before when you manufactured a car and you put in certain switches, you never got the real in insights if they're using those services or those switches. With now having online services, you're able to customize those features, update it overnight, and then your interface can change constantly to keep the user interacting and enjoying the experience. Yeah, I think the, um, if I can add, Peter, the, the term we've used is previously we've been looking at a connected car, whereas now we're looking at a connecting experience. And then from, from our brand's perspective, aligning those connecting experiences with our brand values so that we can still offer something in a digital world that is also brand centric uh, to align with the product as well. But we've, had a, we've had a couple of questions coming online on the, the issue of computing power, what this all does to the car's range, particularly if we're looking at electric vehicles. Um, I wonder, James, if you've thought about whether that's an impact or not on, on EV range. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, of course we, we have. It's an important point, particularly when we start looking at some of those, those features and technologies of the future. Um, we uh, have uh, an awful lot of extensive work going on with our, with our parent company, Tata, ensuring that we have the battery technology to a level that it will support all of those requirements. We've mapped out those requirements all the way to the end of the next decade so that they're fed in to that team to ensure we are more than capable to cover that in that time period. Thank you. We've had a question come in, uh, which is about shared in-car experiences what are the learnings from planes and trains and taxis where native systems are largely redundant? No one gets on a plane, well, no one gets on a plane now, but when people get on planes, they don't get on a plane and turn on the entertainment system and go, goodness me, this is very high tech and new. Um, what are the learnings that you feel there are, Amanda, I'll come to you first on this, from that environment that you feel the car makers could learn from? <laughs> well, don't go down the same route, I think is probably <laughs> to start off with. Um, I, th well, I, I mean, I think it's actually impressive how the automotive industry has really 
picked up the baton here um, and, and started moving very quickly. I think the, the one thing that maybe would concern me slightly is, again, I'm looking at products that are coming to market either now or in the very near future. I feel that it's still quite a lot more of a scattergun approach. So, you know, I think when we're looking like beyond today to the car really of the future and we're, we're really looking then at autonomous and, and, and car ride hailing and that sort of thing, um, I think the car of today is, is, as I say, the scattergun. It's trying to be all things to all people. And I think as we move to the future where we start having more mission-specific vehicles, so just as a, a town vehicle, a car for longer distance and, and rural, whatever, um, I, th I think then the, the, the tasks that we're going to be asking that car to undertake, meeting room functions, picking up your dry cleaning, ordering a coffee, whatever it may be, that that will be very different. So I think it's impressive, as they were, where we are today. I would just urge people not to try and do all things for all people as we look to the future. What's well, the problem at the moment? Because at the moment you buy a vehicle and you can use that vehicle for basically anything. And there is going to come a point, potentially in the future, if autonomous vehicles work, that actually you'll get specific applications, yes. specific ones. And um, James, how are you guys thinking about how autonomy changes what you do around in vehicle experiences because then presumably you can have anything you can have you know 360 panoramic cinema screens and you know the sky's the limit i, I mean it's the we spoke six years ago and talked about autonomous vehicles being maybe five years away and we're sat here Turns out we were wrong 22, 22 <laughs> and they're not there just just not just a few miles from here and so you know in a lot of our minds autonomy has always has always been that five years away but i think we'd all agree it's closer uh it's closer now, but it's actually about how do you take the technologies that are there and integrate them into a vehicle to, although you may not go fully autonomous everywhere by, a certain, by that time period, being able to actually pick out the cases that will be useful to a customer, uh, affordable from a, from a cost perspective, um, but also very, very customer centric so that it integrates a number of the features. A lot of the autonomous features today are very non-integrated and don't provide a seamless experience. I think what it will happen is you'll see a number of those user cases coming to life very soon. And two or three features integrated well together will then provide the opportunity to integrate, and this is why we're doing it, integrate all of those services into that vehicle environment where customers will have that time to do other things. And it's very clear in the way that legislation is being written that we as uh, OEMs have to provide that solution through the vehicle as well, through the in-vehicle technology. Um, Barry, I want to come to you next, and then Thomas, how are you thinking about autonomy? What difference is that going to make in terms of experiences? I think, uh, going back to what you just said, is five years ago, everyone was big about 5G, everybody was talking about autonomous and how it was going to interact, and then laws and regulations came in. So a lot of the software is there and the capability is there, but laws and regulations come in. I see now that there's a massive change in the last 18 months from any of the OEMs to get those user experiences right because that's something that can affect and that can have an impact and get those insights and see it in real time now. And I think that's where it's happening. I think autonomous vehicles are still a while away. I think five years, I think we're all being a little bit bullish on that is what I would say to you yet again, because as I said, the technology is there, but the laws and regulations, that's where the governing bodies haven't come in and agreed what a framework looks like. So I think it goes back to, again, in the, in the short term, I think the next three to five years is going to be down to user experiences. It's going to be added in services. And that's where you're going to see cu customizable effort, I think, in my opinion. Great, thank you. Thomas, how, how does autonomy change how you think about the technology that's needed in the car? Yeah, I, I think uh, the autonomous car is, is a unique thing because uh, from Qualcomm point of view, it is more or less the, the largest uh, internet of thing that we are building in mankind. And it's also the most autonomous robot that we are going to build. So I think it's super excited to uh, put technology in these uh, autonomous vehicles. And at the end, I think it's all bringing us much more life back because we can enjoy riding the car. Uh, we can enjoy our infotainment systems inside the car. And maybe one point here is what, what makes really unique is in the cars, you have really super well integrated technology like your displays, like your audio system or voice control system. So that is really the major difference than as a train or, or, or a plane, for example. And so I'm super excited to see how our technology will power the future of these autonomous cars and really, really will bring us a new experience that I would say my kids will be used to it while I was still a learning car driving with a uh, gear shift. Yeah? So this is what will be changed and this is what uh, human mankind will bring us to the next level.
Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time, I'm afraid. Thank you to Thomas, Amanda, James, and Barry. Uh, please thank our panel.